So welcome everybody to a uh, Mutations Book Club discussion for Ursula K. Le Guin's The Lathe of Heaven. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining me today and for listening to this if you're listening afterward. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite books and uh, it was recommended to me by some of our patrons here. So uh, of course I was like, well, yeah, of course we could have another discussion book. Two years ago, we did a, a book club for this book uh, when the Patreon was much smaller. Um, so now it's kind of fun to see uh, the extended community coming around here. And there's more than one Le Guin reader appreciator um, in this community. So I'm not alone <laughs> in, uh, in my admiration for Le Guin's writing. But um, why, do, why I picked this one particularly um, a, it came up quite a bit recently, and then B, uh, it's probably a good introduction to Le Guin's writing style, and it packs so much into it between the two characters of George Orr and Dr. Haber. Um, their discourse and rapport back and forth with one another, another is just fantastic, and there's just so much laced into their discussions and their attitudes, their assumptions, their, um, their poise in relation to one another that Le Guin, I know, is making a point of. In, their, in those in those debates about whether or not to use George's very unique ability to dream things into reality. Um, so in it is a big sweeping metaphysical discussion about the nature of being and dreams and consciousness, uh, what to do and how to make things and you know what is the relationship of the will with being. Um, and then she, she says in one of those interviews that I may or may not have posted for us, uh, but it is the interview in which uh, I think it's the PBS one where she's talking about the the adaptation from like 1980. And she's saying that this is a very Taoist book. So a lot of those principles and themes run throughout the text and through the character George Orr. Um, but it also is sort of a condemnation of, of uh, this Western Eurocentric notion of how to improve the world through progress, right? Through good intentions. So very interesting commentary on that just through the story itself, right? So yeah, first of all, like we normally do with our book club sessions or any of our uh, mutation sessions, maybe maybe we can get some first impressions for from folks, particularly if this is your first time reading the book, um, what, what your experience was reading Le Guin for the first time or this Le Guin text for the first time. Um, or if you're not and you're just jumping in the bit to share, I would love to hear from you as well. Like, I don't know, what was this like for you, this this particular text, or why join us for for this text today? And feel free to popcorn because we got a little group. So, yeah. I, hey Tracy, first, welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is the first time reading this book, though. Um, in high school, I remember reading the Earth Sea trilogy and then following up with the books she wrote after that in that same universe and was completely intrigued by that world. Um, and then also recently reread Dispossessed. Um, so I was all super excited about this Lathe of Heaven. Um, and I uh, coincidentally am in the middle of kind of a lucid dreaming class. So it was really bizarre to have this sort of dreamscape and dreaming into reality and trying to, to spawn lucid dreaming at the same time as reading this book. So. As I was reading the book, every once in a while, one of the practices is to ask, is this a dream? Look around and see if anything's changed. And so um, I kept, with each new chapter in the book, it was almost like, wait, is this a dream? So it really put me into this um, mindset of being, feeling very fluid with time and these different continuums, as they, he called it, or Haber called it. Um, but I refer to them as kind of timelines and sort of how, how reality seems to shift based on mindset, um, waking or dreaming. Uh, so I loved reading it, um, had a blast. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Um, you know, just on that brief note, as we continue to go around here at the opening, uh, something interesting that happened for me was in rereading the text, um, I had done a visualization meditation with my wife from the Monroe Institute and the image of a volcano popped up, which was interesting. And I thought, okay, that's a very clear image of a volcano. I don't know why that, and I, this is before I had really gotten to that part in the book. Um, 
and so it could have been like just an unconscious thinking about uh, Mount Hood and and uh, and the text. But then later that day in Iceland, the volcano erupted. Right. <laughs> so I've just been like, what is the image of the volcano that's been showing for showing up for me this read around, which is very interesting. Just made me think of that. Um, yeah, let's just keep going around. Yeah. So impressions. Uh, why this book? What stood out for you? Um, Carrie. I yeah. Um, hi, I um, I hadn't read it before. I hadn't read any Le Guin before at all. Um, and I read it all in one go. Not only did I read it all in one go, I read it yesterday. I got confused and thought this was yesterday. And so I read it as an audio book at 2.6 times the normal speed. So <laughs> it was one hell of a book to do that with. And, um, but while I was reading it at the normal speed to begin with, before I realized I was running out of time, theoretically, um, what really uh, stood out for me were the shifts in consciousness and how the characters shifts in consciousness, um, even though it's from multiple characters' points of view at various points, um, that kind of felt um, like the shifts of consciousness that I experienced myself when, Ever that happens. Um, so it was really, um, I've never experienced that in a book before. I think the nearest I can think of cognitively is the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, but I don't experience it when I read that. Whereas with this, there was very much the same kind of almost empathy effect of feeling that happening, which as a kind of phenomenological shift was a very interesting and unsettling and, and fascinating experience. Um, and I think I'm kind of still processing it. I think it is, it has kind of, also the way the characters interact with each other, because generally when I read about these shifts, it's not an interpersonal thing. Um, so, you know, these sudden changes, for example, the scene where um, the, psychiatrist therapist is um realizes the woman he's brought in realizes that this is actually happening and then just suddenly he he is like should I murder her and um just like then the banality of the conversation after that knowing that this is happening it was like Hitchcock it was like so well written but that's all I have to say about that oh I I think you'd appreciate this but um I'll have to find the source, but but Le Guin mentions Philip K. Dick as one of the inspirations for this book in particular. That that mm -hmm. uh, her appreciation for Philip K. Dick's style was in, informed this text and the style of writing. So I think that's really interesting. That makes a lot um, of sense. Yeah, yeah, it does doesn't it? Um, but yeah, that that's that scene, and even the scene when Dr. Haber has the realization that this is real, right? There is an intensity of experience as the reader where you're going, whoa, with Dr. Haber, right? Um, and there's so many wonderful little bits and pieces we could talk about, like even towards the end of the book, what really st uh, stood out for me, like it is a dream, like there are certain sequences in the in the book that feel like my, my own dreams. I, I don't really know how to, like they communicate like a dream, like the one mm -hmm. where uh, Haber asked uh, or to dream of world peace and then he dreams of of something happening with the moon like that sometimes i'll i'll recall the visuals that the book impressed upon me and go where is that from was that a dream oh no that's from the lathe of heaven so it just had that intense surreal quality and then even her writing in that passage changed to a kind of joycean mm -hmm. writing style she was kind of cobbling together different word fusions mm -hmm. it was just very interesting it is um, th that shift you know, to dream language. I've never seen a dr dreams written so dreamlikely. And um, it's it's just fantastic. And um, oh, what was I going to say? I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, yeah, just also the intensity of um, you know, the outcome, because in a lot of science fiction, there's almost this tendency to be quite blasé about really quite major events. So it's like, oh, well, you know, Saturn's just blown up, 3,000 people have just died. And, you know, <laughs> there isn't that sort of, somehow the affect is almost impossible to convey, but it's actually conveyed in this. It's like absolutely existentially mind-blowing and certainly reading it as quickly as I read it, it was like, oh my God, this is, this is like, too much. It was just fantastic. 
That, I just want to comment on that. The with the interesting way that she flipped these huge things, like all of a sudden the plague happened or the war or it didn't happen, was describing it in a beautiful way because in Orr's and Haber's minds, it happened just then, but all of a sudden they had six years of memory. So it was both commonplace and strange at the same time. And it reminded me of some uh, sort of hypnotic techniques where you where you assume the strange as normal and speak as it if it, and it sort of puts the other person in a trance in a way so I felt very entranced by that writing technique yeah that yeah, accumulation of memories that that, yes. that 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 you just spoke about Teresa, this, that 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 to me seems so like my own dreams like that they can be unbelievably abstract and not make any rational sense when i wake up but in the process of experiencing them as a dreaming being um like i know i've been there before i have th there's that whole sort of library of events and understandings about it that you can't articulate when you wake up but it's like an instant download in the dream. <laughs> you know, you get the whole backstory at the same time that you encounter the dreamscape. And, and that's, uh, that's like to, to just write through that moment. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, very intense. Yeah. Um, any, any further popcorns at the moment, or we could certainly. Okay. Yeah. Um, Karen, yeah. I haven't read Ursula Le Guin in about 30 years. <laughs> I, I read several of them way back when. I Always Coming Home, I think, was the last one that made a la the Of all of her books, that one had made the biggest lasting impression. So I came to this. Uh, I had not read this one before. And I read it in a big rush yesterday because that was when I had time for it. So I skimmed over a lot of the details. And I'm sure I missed a lot. But of all the many wonderful bits and pieces that I, I noted that came through in so many wonderful ways. My, the, what's mainly getting my antenna wiggling at this quick read through is the playing with that great metaphysical concept of to what degree do we co-create reality? To what degree does our consciousness, subconscious consciousness co-create the manifest physical reality around us? And that's, that's what I'm just kind of vibrating with now, because this is a, a, a big theme in, in my life right now in other ways. So it was a, a real synchronicity for me to be reading this text right now. Well said. And there, there's a Another reason or a subtext for choosing this text in particular, um, you know, in the mutations community, we study a lot about integral theory and integral philosophy. Um, and Le Guin is one of my literary heroes uh, in, in the sense that I'm just so inspired by her writing style and bringing together philosophy, metaphysics, narrative, science fiction, fantasy, all of that. Um, and her attitude is intrinsically, she says, it's Taoist. And many of the principles of, of my own understanding and then what I think is Gepser, Gene Gepser, the philosopher's take on integral philosophy and what it means to be integral in the world sounds very resonant with a lot of the characters and descriptions that Le Guin has. And it's in relation to these big questions about what do we do with history? What do we do with the human will? Um, what do we do with the separate self sense? How do we relate to the world and how do we relate to being? And this, this is a little book about very big questions that we wrestle with being and dreaming and doing right so i think it's a beautiful masterful text in in that integral inquiry that you're you're pointing to karen um like even there's a let's see if i can get the the passage up here um well i'll i'll, I'll find a couple of notes as we go along here to to share on the screen but let's well, jeremy i'll pop, pop in yeah. Endel, hey hey nice to see you i'm kind of new to the book group and i'm coming from that gepser uh, conversation very much and I'm very much uh, uh, this I have encountered Le Guin in the in Tao translation so this is the first time I've encountered her as a, a writer in in the science fiction or whatever genre we're delving into here but um, the other thing I'll just say at the start for me is that I'm also reading psychology and alchemy um, Jung's collected works 11 about, uh, again, a lot of dream interpretations and in the context of wholeness and, and things like that. So um, very Gibsarian. Uh, and I'll just 
leave a comment um, on the vein of the Gepser is that the dream world itself and this whole book, I'm so in agreement with, I, I read the book like a trance, like, like a dream trance. And you cannot, anytime you get a little grounding in a perspective, it shifts. And that to me is that movement into that integral, a perspectival um, transparency and liquidity and fluidity. And then the other point I'll open with is that thematically, what was fascinating to me was the engagement between um, the uh, self and the other in the form of the alien. And yes, there is such an interplay, uh, how we project violence out into the world. Uh, there's just a beautiful passage there where all of a sudden you, you realize that the, the alien um, creature is actually very um, benign and we have created this terror out of it. So, and that's that interplay uh, someone just talked about for me, it's the interplay between the what is and what we project. And uh, I guess epistemological dualism, if you want to be fancy, but all right, thank you. And also, so good to have you here and welcome to welcome to the book club. I hope to see you for, for future sessions as well. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right about a lot of those points, uh, particularly the, the alien. Uh, the way the way that occurs right between um asking for world peace and then there's some kind of explosion on the moon and then uh i think it was it was heather doing a guided uh session and dream session for him saying okay dream of them off the moon right but the way this works right you to your point when you try to control the dream world with this waking mind it never does exactly what you ask it to and 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 George is always trying to hammer that point home to poor Dr. Haber, who's flustered. Like I'm telling you to do thing, and you're just you're you're not a good instrument for this. You're too wishy washy. Like you you need somebody with a rational mind going in there to order your dreams up, and that's why I'm gonna have to uh, you know take over for you, right? And that's been his attitude, but it never works, right? It just it, it's always like okay, dream the aliens off the moon. Well, what does that mean? Well, they come down to earth then. Um, and there's a kind of a funny exchange where he's like, you know, Dr. Haber, that's not how it works. You can't just tell me to do a thing like, you know, you're telling my subconscious mind, you know, it's not going to work like a conscious mind does, um, which you think Dr. Haber would know, but, <laughs> um, oh, you're, you're muted, Endel, if you had it. I was just going to throw in the fact that it's not, it's not, it works as metaphor, not literally. Exactly. You know? And so, and, and that's such a good, uh, Haber is such a good embodiment of the mental structure of Gebster's, you know, it's oh, yes, scientific, yes. rational, and it, it just can't quite get there. Right. I mean, he's great. He's such a good character for the mental. Um, he's yeah. so fun. Um, I, I think I mentioned this, that, uh, that I read this book out loud uh, with my wife uh, two years ago or so when we first did this book club. And uh, D doing Dr. Haber was so fun, actually. It was so fun to assume his posture and his voice and everything. It really kind of got you into the into the character. So I, I, I have a very fond memory of, of uh, kind of performing Dr. Haber with my <laughs> with my wife. Um, but yeah, so so there's so much in here. Uh, I'm thinking of, of particularly the line where where to to Karen's point as well, where, where Dr. Haber and, and uh, George Ortiz, the end of the book, are having a discussion about um, basically that you can't really, because we are conscious beings with an ego and we have this mental consciousness in, in the evolution of life, that we have to kind of work at it to align with the way, you know, we can't just do whatever we want. So there's this kind of implicit evolution of consciousness that she's explaining and describing here. Um, but it's right there at the beginning too, in terms of how how everything opens with the with the jellyfish, right? They they kind of go with the waves, and yet there is a becoming, and there's an emergence that happens. But it happens of itself with these little jellyfish that are aligned with the way, right? Which is her point of like, how do we align ourselves with the way as conscious beings with a sense of self self separation from the world? That's that's the rub, right? Um, so it's such a fascinating book, but uh. Let's keep popcorning. Any? I was just going to say, I the the opening a uh, few paragraphs before the break um, literally took my breath away in sort of the poetic beauty of the way 
just that last line of equating this entire scene of the jellyfish on the sand being pushed out the waves as us waking from a dream. And it just, I was, oh, it was so beautiful. And if you have read Gepser, you may know this, Gepser's particular emphasis on Odysseus and some of the Greek myths and Odysseus wait, um, arriving on the awakening shores of the mental consciousness in, in Gepser's interpretation. So there's some structures of consciousness at play here too, with the dreaming and the waking um, relating yeah. to one another. And, and I can't help but pipe in. So you mentioned Joyce very briefly in passing, but the Odyssey, um, Ulysses and stream of consciousness was, uh, you know, an exploration of a lot of this subconscious sort of uh, movement. And yes, my mind, all of a sudden, I'm catching myself working that way. It's just a beautiful capture. Very much. If I could just like read that passage, though, the Joycean one, and, and feel free, we could do that. We can just read around here if you have a particular passage you'd like to share. But it's from page 83 of my little version. I'm not really sure where it is in the newer edition, but um, he says, okay, so this is where, and I love the sequences. Have you noticed that too, just how masterful it is when, when we switch to dreaming? Uh, like literally Haber says, you, you will enter the hypnotic state now, George, uh, said Haber's deep voice. You are, and then lowercase dark and then in the dark. And that's the, that's the little liminal transition. Um, not quite yet, not, not quite night yet. Late twilight on the fields, clumps of trees looked black and moist. The road he was walking on picked up the faint last light from the sky. It ran long and straight, an old country highway cracked blacktop. A goose was walking ahead of him about 15 feet in advance and visible only as a white bobbing blur. Now and then it hissed a little. Even that is just so vivid. I'm, I'm like walking there with him. The stars were coming out, white as daisies. A big one was blooming just to the right of the road, low over the dark country, tremulously white. When he looked up at it again, it had already become larger and brighter. It's in Eugene, he thought. It seemed to grow reddish as it brightened. In red and huge, <laughs> the eyes swam. Small blue-green streaks zipped about it zigzagging brownian round roundian <laughs> a vast and creamy halo pulsated about big about big star and tiny zips fainter clearer pulsing oh no 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 he said as the big star brightened eugenly burst blinding he fell to the ground covering his head with his arms as the sky burst into streaks of bright death but could not turn onto his face must behold and witness the ground swung up and down, great trembling wrinkles passing through the skin of earth. Let be, let be, he screamed, along with his face against the sky, and woke on the leather couch. Just, ugh, I love that. One paragraph there. Um, and then he's back in the office with Dr. Haber, but just such a vivid, not very long to take us there. It just, it switched right, I mean, you know, the bottom of uh, page 80, uh, 83, and then the top of page 84, and we've already kind of gone through almost like a condensation of time right just like the way dreams can often be in her writing style there and seems to be condensing this whole vivid um uh a temporally extended experience of seeing this fantastical event in the heavens and then snapping back so anyway a any other thoughts or, or sharings here um i i was just uh, watching one of the movie versions of it, the, the, the 2002 version and, and the, the other one before that. The, the thing that stands out most, if, if you watch these, is, well, the, the, one of them anyway, is that the, the, um, the actual real world, the consensus reality was destroyed. There was a nuclear war <laughs> and George shifted the whole timeline, shifted the whole continuum so that everything could continue, let be. I don't know if it was that, that particular, uh, what you were quoting there, but it sounded similar to that. But uh, so it, it, you're starting out with this, this sense of unreality, like the rug has been pulled out from under everything and now we're just floating and drifting like the jellyfish and, and we don't know where we're going. And it, it, that, that, that sense of unreality of surrealism just pervades and continues to 
it just becomes more and more so as it goes on. Finally, you have people walking around with gray skin. That, that's the solution. And then you have sea turtles coming down. And it, it's just completely bizarre. So I, I, I keep uh, asking, okay, where, where do you, where's the reality here? How do you anchor yourself in the, in the midst of this? Or, or are we just going to keep floating? And I, I think what came out in the, the movie versions, at least, is that the one thing that anchored George was his relationship with Heather. Love is <laughs> actually the, the one anchor, the one thread of continuity through the whole thing. Yeah, well said, Tom. Uh, yeah, that that's definitely. I mean, towards the end, we have, and I, and I like I like his choice of profession, uh, like making uh, like kitchenware and crafting things with his hands. It's very concretizing. Um, and yes, and then the love the love of his his, I mean, in one timeline, wife, uh, girlfriend, human being that he loves more than anything. Um, yeah, that, that was what was concretizing. And actually towards the end, with the whole surreal breakdown of reality, when Dr. Haber finally gets into the machine himself, is, is there's a particular passage where he's, uh, where, or it is basically crossing an abyss of nothing with only, you know, the sound of Heather's voice and his love for her and um, the song, I need a little help from my friends from, from his buddies who gave him that gift of the, the Beatles record. Right. So that, that's what helped him cross the abyss of nothing is, is getting a little help from his friends. Um, so I think that's interesting and in telling, but here's the, I found the passage actually from uh, the kind of evolutionary passage that I've always found very striking on, on page 161 of my version is right towards the end of the book. Uh, a couple pages before the end of chapter 10. Um, he's talking about the, the Aldebaranians. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the alien's name correctly, but he says, um, they're a lot more experienced than we are, are at all this. And then Haber asks, at what? He says, George Orr says, at dreaming, at what dreaming is an aspect of. They've done it for a long time, for always, I guess. They are of the dream time. I don't understand it. I can't say it in words. Everything dreams. The play of form, of being, is the dreaming of substance. Rocks have their dreams, and the earth changes. But when the mind becomes conscious, when the rate of evolution speeds up, then you have to be careful, careful of the world. You must learn the way. You must learn the skills, the arts, the limits. A conscious mind must be part of the whole, intentionally and carefully, as the rock is part of the whole unconsciously. Do you see? Does it mean anything to you? And of course, Haber dismisses it, but I just love that particular passage, kind of linking the evolution of consciousness with Taoism, with you know where we are right now, perhaps in history. Um, um, yeah, Carrie? It interests me that in reading it, and particularly that sort of area of it, um, it does seem to me that Le Guin has a lot in common with Philip K. Dick's metaphysics. And yet she, um, she, basically said that he'd gone mad. So where lies the difference, I wonder? Because it seems to me that deep down, they're pretty much on a very similar page. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I don't honestly know. Maybe maybe she, she sees uh, Phil as somebody who kind of wandered off a little too far or something, you know? Uh, because you're right, they seem to be exploring the same question about being and dreaming and reality. Um, especially this book, I think it so wonderfully illustrates. So I don't know. I, don't I think, know. yeah, I think that's an interesting question for me because I've never read Le Guin for that reason. I thought, yeah. well, there, there's probably not all that much in there for me if she's like rejected my favorite subject, i.e. like <laughs> in the exegesis. And then I get to this book and it's like, oh, okay, this is interesting. I will look into this. And some of her, like her, like we were just say, saying, or Tom was just saying, like the response is what holds you through that is empathy. It is connecting with other human beings. And that seems to be a very Phil Dickian theme as well, right? The mm -hmm. sense of communion and love and, and, and caring for each other in a universe that makes no sense, you know, like that's, that's your silver lining. That's like your, that's your lifeline. So they seem to come together on that as well. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. I, I don't know where exactly, um, uh, her, her pushing off from Phil is coming from, but maybe we can explore that in an ongoing mm. way here. 
Ooh, Karen. Karen Karen's yeah. has a thought. Yeah, well, I've, I've read a fair amount of Phil K. Dick also, you know, decades ago. In fact, I live in Berkeley, which was part of Phil Dick's hunting grounds. I almost met him once. Uh, so uh, my take on Ursula Gwynn, Phil Dick, and I have not read the comment you have apparently uh, of what Ursula Le Guin said about Phil Dick, but my sense of reading Phil Dick all those years ago was this man, like Ursula Le Guin, had some great insight into great spiritual openings, you know, the real, the real McCoy, but at the same time, there was a real mental pathology there. He was, he was not a mentally healthy man, and I remember like 30 years ago formulating to myself, well, he's, Phil Dick has these terrific great insights into in you know, spiritual awakenings and being Phil Dick, he puts it in terms of a paranoid conspiracy and it makes for terrific fiction, very, very deep fiction. Ursula Le Guin has these insights also and, and I have a something tab to read later if there's time. Um, she doesn't, she didn't have the mental pathology. She was, she was robustly mentally healthy but she goes through this book and my issue with this book is that she goes through so much dystopia and I, I have a reaction to this as I think I've said to in one of Jeremy's forums before I've read so much dystopian fiction and I I agree with the premise of this story that we do co that we do have a share in co-creating our reality. Let's start start telling some stories that are not dystopian, that are real possible bright futures. And it, it's one of my passions, as you can probably tell. I'm kind of sounding a little excited about this. But so so there, here's where I see a, a, a bridge between Ursula Le Guin and Phil Dick that they have this terrific insight into these great greater spiritual dimensions, and they're passing it through their consciousness in the form of in Phil Dick's uh, case um, paranoid conspiracy theories makes for terrific fiction, and in Ursula Le Guin's this astonishing story with all these different horrible things that happen. And the only reason I could stand it was because it wasn't really quite real and it was floating from one to the other. And my feelings, can, can we now start telling stories about our possible worlds that don't have to go through the horrors that we can say, yes, there's shadows in the background but they're not the foreground. And I do love, but I love, I have to say, I love the point that Jeremy and, and the couple of others of you just made that the through line for this was the love, the love between Orr and Heather. And, and, I'm, uh, and that's what pulled him through. And that last line, when he meets her at the very end, the last page, and, and George meets Heather again, and she doesn't remember in this, but he does. And so he's meeting her once again. And what was that word? I think I memorized it. The, the, the fierce, recalcitrant, fragile one, always having to be one again. But he now he knows how to talk to her because he remembers all his lives. He knows how to make her laugh. So he says, oh, let's go have some coffee. And that, and that condenses so many romances, you know, hundreds of thousands of women's romances take a whole story to get to that point. And Ursula Le Guin just got the gist of it in, you know, with a minimum of words and the maximum of beauty and depth and precision. So, I mean, I, I, I just gasped at the end of the book. Well, I was gasping at a number of places through I'm gonna jump in here because Karen, I think one of the things that makes this book so incredibly powerful and, and, and how it deals with what is right relationship, not just with other people, but with everything, is that all of these horrible things that happen in the book are happening all the time right now in various places to various degrees. And so it, it, it doesn't, in a way it doesn't come out, off as dystopian at all, but it does get to that kind of root thing of what is right relationship and what is the relationship between dreaming and intention and not just in dreams, but in this reality. Be, before I reread this um, a few months ago, and again, <laughs> about a week ago, I, I, I tell people this is one of my favorite books because in a way it seems more realistic than anything else I've read. Because in a way we so much shape our world 
as an individual and with our relationship to that. And since I've been doing a lot of work um, with, with Nora Bateson lately, it also really ties in with not only what is right, right relationship, but what is right intention that doesn't, <laughs> that isn't from that mental sphere, from the perspectival, which, which just by trying to fix it, it guarantees you're going to make it worse. And, and even though it's seemingly random with the dreams and how they turn out in another way, it keeps illustrating, if you try to fix things, you're going to make them worse. It's that, it's that Nora, Nora's double bind with, with yes. the Batesons, the, the concept of the double bind. Like there's a way you go at it that actually makes things progressively worse or more complicated. Mm -hmm. So like the, the response could be something orthogonal. You know, and, and what, what I really like about the book, and we'll, we'll jump to uh, Kelly after this too, is um, the way in which this is sort of a, a, a condensed form of, of uh, global history, uh, especially right at the end when the city is melting down and Portland's kind of becoming a surrealistic painting and the volcano's exploding and the buildings are drooping like jello. There's a sense in which all of, all of the sort of Western history is happening all at once. The history of the 20th century is just this tapestry at the end of the book, right? This everything is melting down. There is this nakedness of the unreal, which everyone's facing. And Gebster talks about that too. And I find that interesting because he, he kind of points to the existentialists as sort of the the the, the habers of the world in the sense of that they've they've turned towards the unreal, right? They're no longer aligned with being. And so there's this nakedness and fear and like a, um, and severing from things that they're all experiencing when they're mistaking as reality. They're calling, okay, that's the real, but it's not. It's actually unreality. And there's that beautiful line at the end about, um, you know, we can bear 84, 88, 90 years, 100 years of, of, of reality just fine as human beings. It's unreality that breaks us. So there's this kind of interesting um, reversal she's doing with, uh, with the existentialists in that context. Um, <laughs> Let me throw in just a grounding to that. I'm sitting in Minneapolis, less than a, a mile from ground zero of George Floyd Square, watching this play out. And it is um, totally dystopian. And it is exactly that, that, you know, people are trying to fix something in a way that's making it worse. And that there is this, this line of love that, that that is what is being explored in my uh, contemplative community, for instance, you know, trying to move into that, um, that opening of, of question, of heart space, rather than certainty and answer and all of those structures. So I just, I just throw that in there because it's absolutely concrete here. It, it's, 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 it's showing up every day and we're in the midst of all sorts of crises at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I read the book. The city is melting. Okay. I, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I read the book like, like, of uh, some of us have been saying here that it is sort of a reflection of our world, a distillation of the past few centuries. Uh, but also it's an exit. It, there, there's an exit here. There's a, there's a different relationship with being that George Orr and Le Guin through the, the, the subtext of this book is putting forward, right? Like how do we align with being? What have we been doing that has been causing basically a, a Hibarian couple of centuries, right? And how can we live differently and be differently? live in accordance with the way um yeah let me, let me go to kelly before we jump am i unmuted i'm unmuted oh good for me um yeah i was thinking when you were speaking karen and also uh tom and you and your res, in your response it, it's uh, uh what i got from from this because i read it again also yesterday uh, um and uh, but i've read it several times and and something that struck me about this reading apart from a paragraph which I have to talk to uh, Veronica about, um, but was a way that a way that George changes, and it was actually this 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 this, uh, and it circles around to um, sort of a push against the dystopian. These elements that appear that are seem so powerful, like the moment when he's in the in the the subway and he has this. Um, this realization, this enormous sense of well-being, and she talks about how all the people around him all of a sudden feel well-being, or uh, because it's such a strong, or or when when he goes into uh, in a later incarnation, 
they wake up after smoking weed and listening to the Beatles and, and he goes into the kitchen and sees Heather's back. She's in there cooking. And, and he looks at her with such joy. I, I think that she writes the response is the greatest gift that she's ever received um, is, is the way she phrased it, something like that. But, but, but what's interesting is from the beginning of the book, George is described as like, she's really harsh. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's being described through people's, you know, particular Haber, but, but also Heather's like other, other characters perception of him as being weak, spineless, a total pushover, like, you know, completely. And, and George does this to himself. And, and it was when you talked about the goose, I said, didn't he describe himself as the goose right before that dream that, that Haber doesn't want to kill the goose. And then he says to himself, that describes me perfectly, a damned, white, vapid, stupid goose. But in the dream, this amazing goose that's walking in front of him, it's him. And, and, and that's what I realized that to me, that really began to make this link between, between him and these aliens that were always him, that he speaks about, you know, he called them because he made them. And it, and it returns to this place of um, equanimity. Every time he has a contact with them, this part of himself, which is uh, exactly in the middle of the graph, <laughs> um, is, is activated and, and extends from himself um, in a way that, that impacts everything around him immediately. And, and so in his last conversation um, that he has with Haber, and he's like, don't, you maybe don't want to do what you're about to do. <laughs> it won't, you know, maybe you should say this word, maybe get, get some help from your friends. It might be a good idea. It comes so much from that place and not at all this place at the beginning where he's so um, punitive and all the other characters are sort of punitive to him as, as, a, as a being because of his averageness. I don't know. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then, but then in the, by the middle of the book, she's seeing him as a bodhisattva mm -hmm. and how, how, how easily that shifted. There's, there's a, like at the end of the book, when he's going to, to stop Dr. Haber, uh, the way she talks about George in a in her interview, she's like, "I like George," uh, but she says he's 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 enormously strong, but it's not a strength that is explicit, you know. And I think we, we see that arc anyway for him, kind of coming into that strength, a different kind of strength, by the end of the book, and using that everything he is. And I love that passage with um with his future boss too. Like, I put what what was it? I put everything I had into just pushing a button, like. And the and the um the alien said you have lived well. You've lived well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, but I was thinking, Kelly, of of uh, like the the exaltation of of the of joy that George has in the in the train car, and then the end of the book, kind of juxtaposing that with or uh, with Doctor Haber at the at the asylum, where nobody wants to be around the guy. Can't even he's go staring the room at with unreality. Him because... Yeah. Like it's it's just I can't I can't do it. They back out. Yeah, and even even the the guy who worked there, you know, George says something like I can't, and then he's like, "Yep, you can." I'm right with then, you, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just under it's, it's almost wordlessly spoken without much exposition about what's going on with him. Um, so just as a juxtaposition there, but I think Veronica wanted to jump in too. Um, so you got your. Thank you. I'm very intimidated and I'm like um, Carrie said, I'm, I'm processing and we'll have to percolate for a while, but something that occurs to me that two things, <clears throat> first is this, this mirroring. We mirror each other constantly, but the use of the mental enhancing the ego makes us so reluctant and afraid to see in the other what's in us. We put resistance, enormous resistance to that. And I think, of course, this is what Dr. Haber is subconsciously doing, but anyway. 
And the second thing is about, um, uh, let me see, the mirroring and the, um, yeah, the, uh, the concept of, um, of reality, it sort of escaped me um, what I wanted to say exactly. Um, yes, yes. The, 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 the line between sanity and insanity that we construct with the mental is so thin. It's like the razor's edge that the Buddhists are talking about. And we have so many examples of famous people and people like us who made that fall one way or the other. Carl Jung, and I know we have Carl or your union analyst, I think you are, that um, know that Carl Jung could have become totally psychotic, you know, when he had the, the Philemon story, what became the Red Book and all of that. But he went the other way around. Like you say, Ursula, you know, was very robust. Nietzsche, <laughs> you know, is another one. We could go on and on, Schopenhauer and so on. And what happens in today's world is that we continue to isolate and with very good intentions, I understand, we cannot have psychotic people probably, you know, going loose, but indeed we have actually, as we see in the news every day. But it's all a result of, I think to me, it's this reluctance to accept the mirroring or to even just see the mirroring so that if we had the connection that we all mentioned, possibly we could at least envisage a different way to deal with what we call insanity, which is just another layer of consciousness that we know very little about. We just medicate people. That's all we can do so far. So this is a little pessimistic maybe, but um, again, I have, to, I have to read and reread. And uh, thank you, Kelly, because now I, I borrowed at the library the Always Coming Home. So good. Yeah, That's so I want good. to get into that one now. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like we could become, and thank you, Veronica. I feel like we could become a, a Ursula K. Le Guin reading group for this year, uh, because I was just, Tracy was mentioning the dispossessed. I think, um, you know, I think that would be another good book to read on. Particularly, I mean, for many different reasons, it's a different kind of book. It's much more political oriented, uh, but again, there's like Gibsonian themes of transparency, simultaneity, and time. The collapse of walls or boundaries. I mean, the whole thing is about this, this, the, the theme of the wall and how it opens in that particular novel and superseding those walls and boundaries. So again, there's some inter integral oriented themes that I think Le Guin is always arriving at, always coming home uh, through her writing. I think she, again, was just, was expressing this in a creative literary form um, I wish I wish Gebser could have been around long enough to to uh, experience her work um, because I do think she, uh, she is a reflection of many of the characteristics of of what Gebser was talking about with a perspectivity and even there's like you guys know that um in uh what do you call it the, the George George Feuerstein's book um, decline in participation quotes that he translates in his in his um I think towards the end of the book and. and see if I can find it for us really quick. Uh, one of the final chapters, maybe under the spiritual import, it's in my syllabus as well, where he's he's kind of giving or listing Gepser's characteristics of the integral consciousness. And a lot of it just sounds like George Orr, you know? I mean, at his best in this novel, just not really being, yeah, yeah, haste is replaced by silence and the capacity for silence. Goal-oriented purpose of thought is replaced by unintentionalness. The pursuit of power is replaced by the genuine capacity for love. Quantitative idle motion is replaced by qualitative spiritual process. Manipulation is replaced by patient acceptance of the providential powers. That one particularly for this book. Um, mechanistic classification and organization is replaced by the being in order. 
Prejudice is replaced by the renunciation of value judgments. That is to say, the emotional short circuit is replaced by unsentimental tolerance. Action is replaced by poise. Homo faber is replaced by homo, homo integer. The divided human being is replaced by the whole human being, and the emptiness of a limited world is replaced by the open expanse of the open world. That's beautiful, and it, you know that could just be George Orr at his best in this particular novel. Yeah, um, Tom, you're saying or Taoist exactly, which is the point. Like the Gwyn is is saying this is a Taoist novel, and then if you read Gebser, the characteristics and qualities that he always seems to go to to try to attempt to say what are the what are the flavors and characteristics of integrality in, in a human being and human culture it, it sounds like he's drawing this from a Taoist writing as well or a Taoist philosophy as well so I, I find that to be really interesting and I'm not collapsing the two but holding them together is is a really fruitful I feel um, can, can can I share something super quick mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just after after that passage, it really speaks to this, uh, it, and it's this sort of this Gebserian transparency that's and and also relating to what you just spoke about. Um, and I I wanted to say it, it's it's a little insular, but it, it, it's I wanted to say it specifically to Rebecca and, and Veronica because right after the passage where he has this sense of well being and everybody in the train carriage feels it. <laughs> Um, the guy stops being hungry, you know, the lady stops um, feeling the pain in her foot. Then there is this passage which made me think of something that we spoke about on Sunday in this after hours thing. It was so funny, Rebecca, when you were talking about seeing slow. So so this and then and then you started talking about wanting to be like a plumber, Veronica. Here's this passage. He says, it goes, or was not, it's right after this well being, or was not a fast reasoner. In fact, he was not a reasoner. He arrived at ideas the slow way, never skating over the clear, hard ice of logic, nor soaring on slip streams of imagination, but slogging, plodding along on the heavy ground of existence. He did not see connections, which is said to be the hallmark of intellect. He felt connections like a plumber. <laughs> and I thought that's just way too crazily synchronistic after our conversation two days ago. Um, so I wanted to share it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that was weird. Yeah, that that brings to mind uh, the the other line that that Gebser seems to have arrived at, even though he hadn't read uh, this Taoist literature about breathing from the heels too. Just imagining him plodding along on the earth, the ground, right? Breathing from the heels is a sort of naturalness that George Orr seems to exhibit. Um, and even in the text, like when he is doing his final effort, right? At the end, um, the way Le Guin describes it, right? Uh, by the power of will, which is indeed great when exercised in the right way at the right time, George Orr found beneath his feet the hard marble of the steps up to the uh, Hurad Tower. But just that idea that will is, has a has a place in relation to the whole. The ego has a place in relation to the whole. You know, um, self consciousness has a, a proper and appropriate relationship. What that is, I mean, it's difficult for us for us very often to find that out, but it's there. You know, so that's all I'm going with that just like the will is there the ego is there self is there but in proper relationship with the whole um which again is like a very Gibsonian theme about ego transparency rather than ego annihilation or total collectivization or total atomization right there is this other relationship that the self has with the whole um but yeah let's just keep going around any any other particular passages reflections uh, Karen. Yes, a pass, the pa one passage I, I came prepared to read today reflects on the, what we've been, the last four rounds of conversation here. It's about halfway through the book and I'm, I'm on my device so I don't have a page number. Um, and it's been after the session that Heather observes and then he, she and, and George are talking about it and she's, and she said, please call me Heather. It's a pretty name, says George. Your name's George, he said. He, Dr. Haber, kept calling you George in that session, like you were a real clever poodle or a rhesus monkey. Lie down, George, dream this, George. 
He laughed. His teeth were white and his laugh pleasant, breaking through dissevelment and confusion. That's not me. That's my subconscious, see, he's talking to. It's kind of like a dog or a monkey for his purposes. It's not rational, but it can be trained to perform. He never spoke with any bitterness. This is, this is Heather's point of view here. He never spoke with any bitterness at all, no matter how awful the things he was, he was saying. Are there really people without resentment, without hate, she wondered? People, people who never go cross-grained to the universe? who recognize evil and resist evil and yet are utterly unaffected by it? Of course there are, countless, the living and the dead, those who have returned in pure compassion to the wheel. And that's his, ah, she sees him as a bodhisattva. Those who follow the way, the Tao, that cannot be followed without knowing they follow it. And then she goes on to list a lot, one of those beautiful passages of hers. So that af after that, you know, seeing him as harshly as she saw him in the beginning, kind of agreeing with Dr. Haber, oh, this man is totally weak. And now she's seeing him as, as a bodhisattva, basically. That That's one of the passages among the many that struck me. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful mm -hmm. one. Yeah, I, I, I could, I came out of, I've never been able to get through a science fiction book, <laughs> except th this one. <laughs> and um, I, I, I don't know. Anyway, it, um, I really enjoyed this story. I, I lost track of what a, a lot of places along the way. And I'm certainly getting to have an understanding of how you put something like this together. But what struck me was the aliens. And to me, um, they were the normal. They were the goodness in the whole works. And they were there all the time. And somehow George was using their strength even. And then at, at the end of the book, they came out and they were there in, in form. <laughs> and um, so that, that's sort of where I um, connected with it most was um, that all through the book, with all the hor horrible things happening, these aliens were there with George um, and, and bringing them through this. And, um, but uh, there was so many things that she brought up and all these inter ways she put it together. I had a lobby library copy that I had to bring back. So I, I think I'll get it and read it again and <laughs> see all I missed. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. I'm I'm deeply honored that the first science fiction book you've read is through the mutations <laughs> group, and that is I'm so happy that it's Le Guin. <laughs> yeah. But I think you're right. I love I love the aliens so much. I I, I mm -hmm. more than anything in this book, I wish that they were real <laughs> because I would love to hang out with these guys. Yeah, um, yeah but I, lo I love like right towards the end of the book when after everything that's happened, he's sort of wandering the streets aimlessly, and then he comes across one of the aliens. Um, and they, everything they say, like, it makes sense at an intuitive level, um, to like, he tells them basically to go sleep, sleep that knits up the ravel sleeve, sleeve of care. Oh, we got a little echo here. Um, but I just love, I love that kind of poetic insight. That's like, it doesn't make direct sense coming, coming mm -hmm. at you directly, but in an indirect way, it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's what George Orton needs at this point in the, in the story It's exactly what he needs. Um, and then uh, just the way that they're described, like sea turtles, there's a particular passage where, I mean, there's a link, I think, with the jellyfish in the ocean of dreaming and then the sea turtles that sw swim between the dreaming of different worlds, right? There's a particular dream he has of the turtles. And then when he sees them, um, oh, this one particular passage, 137, a passing alien jostled or slightly in the crowd on the, on the mall. It raised its left elbow to apologize and or muttered sorry 
It stopped half blocking his way, and he too halted, startled and impressed by its nine foot greenish armored impassivity. It was grotesque to the point of being funny, like a sea turtle, and yet like a sea turtle, it possessed a strange, large beauty, a serener beauty than that of any dweller in sunlight, any walker on earth. And that's a little hint of its, uh, you know, not being of the sunlight and day in the day, but of the dream time. Right. And then right towards the end, there's this really funny passage, um, this one line where um, he's meeting Heather again towards the end of the book and his boss, uh, what is it? A Nemen Asfa stood immense in greenish armor holding an egg whisk. Just the image of one of these aliens holding a tiny little egg whisk with delicate, <laughs> delicate yes. balanced fins is just fantastic. Um, anyway. Let's see. Um, Ramona, did you want to jump in? I think you were unmuted before. No. <laughs> oh, no. But I think you are, you're still unmuted. So it, we hear you. So you're good if you want am to I un Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes, you're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I just wanted to say to everyone, I so appreciate all of this. I'm driving and it's made my drive fly by and it's been over an hour and so i'm just kind of switching and the phone is uh doing weird things so i just love the beginning passage jeremy as someone who lives up on the we're in the pacific northwest and we kayak in a place called desolation sound and just her ability with that first which many other people have commented on with the jellyfish and if you see them when you kayak you almost feel what she's speaking about so anyway that was just my small comment but thank you to everyone i've really enjoyed this wow oh, thank you ramona yeah for sure um i i would love to be around some jellyfish we're right by the gulf i need to spend more time uh with some water <laughs> after this book um yeah appreciate that uh veronica did you have a thought yeah i i just love the the quotes that she uh chose on page 73 it is so Gebserian. It's from Lafcadio or Hearn, who is a great writer too. And it says, it may remain for us to learn that our task is only beginning and that there will never be given to us even the ghost of any help, save the help of unutterable and unthinkable time. <laughs> <That's> yeah. I <laughs> I had that highlighted too on my Kindle version, like, whoa, what does he mean by that? <laughs> um, yeah, and then the rest of it, we may have to learn that the infinite whirl of death and birth out of which we cannot escape is of our own creation, of our own seeking, that the forces integrating worlds are the errors of the past, that the eternal sorrow is but the eternal hunger of insatiable desire, and that the burnt out suns are rekindled only by the inextinguishable passions of vanished lives. Oof. It's yeah, kind of a haunting passage as a whole. Reading the book again out of the mm. Mm. Yeah, there's so many of those quotes, those opening chapter quotes that are just fantastic. Like uh, the Victor Hugo in, on ch in chapter seven, uh, daydream, which is thought of, which is to thought as the nebula is to the star, borders on sleep and is concerned with it as its frontier. Yeah an atmosphere inhabited by living transparencies. That line mm. really got me. Yeah. There is a beginning of there's there's a beginning of the unknown, but beyond it the possible opens out immense. Other beings, other facts are there. No supernaturalism, only a, only the occult continuation of infinite nature. I love that too. Yeah. Sleep is in contact with the possible, which we also call the improbable. The world of the night is a world, night as night is a universe. I mean, this like way that Gebser talks about it with the magic and mythic, you know, it, it is a world. Um, uh, night as night is a universe. The dark things of the unknown world become neighbors of man, whether by true communication or by a visionary enlargement of the distances of the abyss. And the sleeper, not quite seeing, not quite unconscious, glimpses the strange animalities, weird vegetations, Terrible or radiant pallors, ghosts, masks, figures, hydras, confusions, moonless moonlights, obscure mm -hmm. unmakings of miracle, growths and vanishings within a murky depth, shapes floating in shadow, the whole mystery which we call dreaming. 
and which is nothing other than the approach of an invisible reality. The dream is the aquarium of night. <laughs> Interesting. That's and that, that last line about... Yeah, it's a good translation from the French because it's mm. difficult and it's beautiful translation. Mm. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, any other lines or thoughts we wanted to share here? I have like a couple of little bits and pieces all over the novel, but um, like towards the beginning, Dr. Haber kind of being depicted as Mount Hood, like when his first office. And there's this, the description of, of the mountain was like, Hood, immense yet withdrawn, breeding clouds about her head, going northward. And it, just describing this sort of big, bold being, right? And here's Haber being introduced as this big, bold being, right, together. Um, I thought that was a little interesting uh, in terms of image making in the novel. But um yeah, where else do we want to go with this? Where else do we want um, to meander? I just want to say that that strikes me as an interesting point in relation to kind of like the interpersonal in integralness of, of the novel. You know, how we see each other has an effect on how we are in some way. I've only just had this thought, therefore I haven't fleshed it out very much, but um, that seems to have like ethical implications, like how we perceive each other. Yeah, that's a good, I mean, that, that opens up a lot too, you know, and, and goes to the, the, the point about earlier when we were talking about how like Heather, not Haber, but Heather, at least her perception of, of George really transforms in this as well. Um, let's see, did someone else want to jump in? Okay, maybe not. I thought it was somebody on mute. Um, but yeah, I, one of the things with, with the volcano and hood, especially towards the end when it erupts as the city's kind of blowing up and and essentially perspectival space is exploding and falling apart. Um, I thought of, especially the line, I mean, the lathe of heaven. I know Le Guin says it's, it's an inaccurate translation and yet it's very appropriate for this novel. Um, this, this passage, this little passage reminds me so much and it can almost be taken out of this context and placed in Akira. And I don't know if if, you, if, if folks have, have watched that recently. I, mean, I know I wrote about it a little bit in my book, but there's a similar kind of intensity because I was thinking about like, okay, who's the volcano? I'm not trying to do a one-to-one -one thing, but the volcano is this sort of intense, more than human energy, this creative energy of the cosmos that is erupting and breaking forth and melting reality down at the end of the novel. It, it's not just... Haber, right? There is this intensity which is blowing up, and even like uh, I think the one of the uh, the aliens mentions that to, to George Orr about kind of getting out of accord with the way, and then volcanoes might blow up. Uh, uh, you know, just all, all this discord can happen. Um, but it reminds me very much of what occurs with uh, Akira in terms of Tetsuo's timeline of like essentially gaining access, being a kind of Doctor Haber. As, as a preteen or a teenager with this immense limitless energy. Um, and then what happens when all that happens, right? The whole universe is, needs to be born by the end of that story. But um, still there's this kind of intensive energy that I think is interesting and it, and it reminds me a little bit of, um, well, this novel saying, and Gepser also says it, that our relationship with these originary powers and intensities can't be mastered by the mental right mental structure of consciousness or the waking ego when we do try to have that happen then we are destroyed on the leaf of heaven as it were um so there is a different there's a right relationship with these energies and intensities and with creativity right to, to karen's point as well how do we what is the right relationship with creativity because we do seem to be co-makers um or in like tolkien's language sub-creators so what is the right level of or capacity of ego and will and and selfhood in relationship to the whole i mean these are really big questions for us as a species right now you know um anyone want to riff on that or, or something well, I'll, I'll just pipe in um it's somewhere for me it's somewhere between dream and waking and it's not so much between but in that interplay in the dance between the two of them and that carried through the whole book for me mm, mm. Ooh, and ooh, and that was was kind of what I was vibrating here because I see 
uh, Dr. Haber as the example of the wrong way to do it, as we've talked around a number of times, basically, he is trying to be in control with his, his, his mental structure, with the Gebser's mental structure. He's trying to impose his idea of how it needs to be and, and forcefully control it, and we see what happens. But I'm really resonating with the whole image of creativity as a volcano, because that's somehow I experience it sometimes, and I just pop off and I'm not in control. Um, trying to you know, get that kind of back, get back in sync. And then this all leads to the next uh, passage I had looked at to, to raise, which is, uh, where is it? It's about uh, um, four fifths of the way through the novel. And this is uh, George Orr's point of view. Of course, he thought his thoughts proceeding also at a walking pace. If that's true, then the whole world as it now is should be on my side because I dreamed a lot of it up too. Well, after all, it is on my side. That is, I'm a part of it, not separate from it. I walk on the ground and the ground's walked on by me. I breathe the air and change it. I am entirely interconnected with the world. And to me, that's one of the great insights that takes us from, you know, the whole Wilbur first tier through all of Gebser's stages into integral is that dawning, one of, one of the key transition points to me is that dawning insight is just how incredibly interconnected we are with everything at all levels, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, I mean, you name it. We, it's, it's all flowing in us, you know, like the Beatles said, can't you see you're really only very small and life flows on within you and without you. And that's kind of the going beyond that Dr. Haber approach of the rational mind, attempting to control it with the rational mind, realizing that we're part of something very big and that we can flow with it like the jellyfish, but that we're also contributing to it that we are co-creating it, but we're not, we're not doing it from trying to be in charge with the rational mind anymore. So that's where I was riffing with what you people have been saying recently. Yeah, that's great, Karen. I, I feel that, um, that Le Guin is attempting to illustrate what the right relationship is through, through Orr's response to actually the 1998 event, which is so cryptically described, right? Like it seems like if we were to if we were to create a crude narrative, it seems like something horrible happened to the world in 1998, and George found his ability of Iaklu or whatever the aliens describe, right? And but he said, "Well, was that different? Like I changed the world." Um, but then he said, "Well, that was out of self preservation. So maybe like out of self preservation or helping one another is the appropriate." relationship, right? Not helping all. In fact, one of the aliens even later on in the book said um, it, it knew, I mean, it was in the dream, that weird dream he had, uh, where it said, you can't give the snake venom uh, antidote to everybody. It can't just be applied universally, right? It's, it's, that's a situational thing where you're helping somebody in an emergency. So again, like again, to that empath empathetic relationship, you, you, you can help people, you can change the world, but it often has to be very intimate, relational, situational, right? It can't be kind of macro utopian, it has to be in like the microcosm of our, of our lives. Um, and then maybe there's, there's some way to scale that a little bit, but like, it has to be rooted like that, right? So I think that's, that's part of her hinting at like, what is the right response? How, what is the alternative to utopias and progress and um, the, the Hibarian approach to um, improving the world, which we've tried, right? Is there another way? And I think she is illustrating that very wonderfully. Um, let's see, I see I see Tom and Kelly nodding and then either of you and then, and then Kel, uh, Veronica. Any thoughts? I just, it, I just wanted to respond really quickly to the, the way the alien said that because I love so deeply the way they speak throughout this they're like speaking little coins the whole time and and uh um and he's talking about how troubled he is in this moment this alien um and 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 george doesn't really know what's going on and and he and he says uh, he talks about um what is it well he says we have also been variously disturbed concepts cross in mist perception is difficult volcanoes emit fire Help is offered refusably. Snake bite serum is not prescribed for all. Before following directions leading in wrong directions, 
auxiliary forces may be summoned. <laughs> and I think that the sort of, it's so human. And you just, it, 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 and I mean that in like a, this, this kind of deep humanity of, of this, these sort of simple containers, this language that she returns to, which is so poetic, it's so essentialized. And he says this, you know, inexplicable word, which George is like, what? And, and, then, and then the alien says, it's if desired, speech is silver, silence is gold, self is universe. Please forgive interruption. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I love them. I want, I want to. Uh, it's beautiful, and and uh, uh, but it's so. It's so. Um, there's something so. It, it, it's it's like they have this direct link. These strange sea turtles. They 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 thematically go right back, um, to this ocean. Only they have this. What I think she calls it earlier, this inexhaustible something, not like the jellyfish, like like they can they can swim there, uh, uh, which is completely different than the jellyfish image. Um, and 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 he opens up this direct line of communication with them uh, that that I don't know. It it it's it's like they come and say, "Here's the right relationship," but. But it's it's up to you. Here's you know it's your choice. Um, I don't know. I'll I'll, I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, I love it. Um, yeah, and that last line too. Uh, um, when he was saying that that last bit, which is how the book ends, like please forgive interruption, crossing in mist. That the crossing in mist, I love because I see them kind of coming in, coming into our world out of this mist and returning to it. And, and then right at the end, of course, uh, um, you know, George and, and Heather kind of walk and cross in the mist, right? Um, so yeah, there is something about them that is very much like a teacher. They're, they're showing us, as you're saying, right relationship. Um, but I will, and I find it interesting that Haber's response to like George suggesting like, well, maybe you should bring them up here and put them in the machine, or maybe you should talk with them. It's very dismissive. Like, well, you know, the, the, our best theorists are saying they may not even be conscious at all. They're just mimicking us. Um, you know, we don't even know if they're really intelligent, just like, like George himself, like there was this complete inability for Haber to actually recognize this other mode of being in the world and actually be in communication with it. Um, but anyway, that's it's yeah, I love I love these guys too. And again, I wish in some ways, I mean, this book makes them feel like they are real, you know. <laughs> I mean, like that last quote in the in the last chapter, Starlight asked non entity, Master, do you exist or do you not exist? He got no answer to this question, however. And just that sense of like being in that liminality of this of this space of this sort of slipstream novel where being and dreaming and waking life are just kind of flowing into one another. Uh, I don't know, there's a, there's a kind of presence of these characters and of these beings, these aliens that feel, I don't know, maybe they are, there is a reality to them, you know? I, we're gonna be exploring that in uh, J.F. Martel's class um, a little bit because we're kind of gonna be in orbit around his book, uh, Reclaiming Art in the Age of Artifice, which sort of explores that, but that's a tangent. I'll, I'll stop talking now. <laughs> um, let's see. I think somebody wanted to jump in. Veronica, yeah. Um, the the passage that Kelly was reading reminded me of the 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 last part of the movie Arrival. I don't know how many. <laughs> when these huge beings, you know, explain, but we want to help humanity, and then why are you in eighteen different places on the planet? You know, did you come to the Russians first or the China? No, it's because you're one planet. <laughs> so, um, and they are so huge and yet so tender and, and compassionate and kind and everything. Um, but I also wanted to comment on the, I think that because we're in the mental so much, so deeply, we might be confusing the use of free will with the use of intentionality because um, 
to me, free will is the very rational that is ego centered. I have free will, you know, so I don't have to get the vaccine or whatever. Versus intentionality is something that is universal. Well, I'm not talking about desires, I'm talking about intentions. And we learn more from our intentions and we connect more through intentions than, than definitely through free will, which is rational and abstract. And I see Dr. Haber as being the free will example, as opposed to the intentional of that 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 George is always attempting to to convey. Well, I think if we're going to use that, um, like with Dr. Haber, he's not transparent with his intentions. You know, like free will and rationalization of like, oh, well, and, and even I think uh, somebody quoted this in our in our feed here, uh, Thomas, and I think Carrie earlier, the ends justify the means, but what if there is never an end? All we have is means. I mean, that's a kind of what, what are our intentions? How are we relating to the world? What is our what is the intentional relationship we have with with life, with being? that needs to be understood because then we can understand how we're acting. But if we're pretending that our intentions are not ends justify the means, that's a, inherently a violent intention, um, then we can't have a right relationship with being no matter how we justify or rationalize like, well, eventually we can have a better society, but for now we will have to do these very problematic things to get there. You know, th that's already, at odds with with things and therefore we're not transparent to our intentions you know we, we rationalize those intentions away um so i would say yeah it has something to do with transparency of, of being aware of our intentionality which is a living relationship with the world that's how i'm and, taking what you're saying and a living relationship with ourself i don't i don't think i can find the passage but ursula grin made i think believe she made the point somewhere where dr haber was um hiding parts of himself from himself, like he was not in integrity with himself. And that was an essential piece of, you know, not being in integrity in right relationship with the world. He wasn't even in right relationship within himself. And that's what got him where he got in the end. Right on, right on. That's exactly he, it. I mean, that's- He wasn't being honest that applies with himself or with George. <laughs> yeah. He had not done his shadow work. <laughs> but there's also a relationship between self and world that I see, and that's the whole point. And that's what I'm trying to say, that the place to be is in that mix that relates. Uh, it moves in and out of self and world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, intentionality has to be a relationship with self and world, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not just in the vacuum of, of our interior person. It's, it's, it's a bridge between ourselves and the world. Um, is somebody else going to jump in, Tom? Are you going to have a yeah, thought? Yeah, there, there was, uh, well, as always, I'm going to bring in another story. Uh, our old friend Tolkien. <laughs> remember, the, uh, those of you who read, you know, the, the book or watched the movie, you remember Saruman. You know, but he, he's the Dr. Haver of, of this particular story. Uh, uh, so, something to the effect that, well, we may have to compromise with the enemy in terms of, you know, uh, uh, achieving our long-term objectives, but it, it, eventually we can steer things the way we want them to go. And what happens to him? He ends up getting completely corrupted and destroyed. <laughs> and uh, that and he, he's just a classic, you know, the wizard who who thought he could master the world through through knowledge, order, and power, whereas Gandalf, the, the other wizard, was uh, very good at at uh, working with uh, people with different cultures and civilizations you know getting them to to take their own initiatives uh, to uh to do what they need to do to get together to defeat the enemy so his, his, his approach worked in the long run it was more subtle and indirect but it, but it actually worked yeah yeah good point there um and working with the way gandalf yeah that's what tom was saying in, in response there um yeah, and even like in the Lord of the Rings, I mean, that's a theme that we can explore eventually, uh, maybe around the time of Becca's class, uh, the right relationship for for Tolkien's universe and story, it seems to be fellowship. And again, the little people doing things to help each other out in the right timing in the right place, 
make all the difference. Um, and I love how the, the really the end of that story is is Sam regrowing the Shire and, and planting things. You know, which is this little beautiful regenerative planting work. But even that is like tempted by the ring. If you remember in that story, there's a yes. particular moment when he's in Mordor. And and he has this vision of like Sam the gardener going to green green the whole world and and even that can be like and then he checks himself you know so the right relationship it, it's so interesting and notice uh, the when the ring returns to the heart of the volcano okay uh, Sauron disappears and and the world moves back into that right relationship okay. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Speaking of volcanoes, right? <laughs> um, Gosh, you know, there's another one. This, well, I, I, sorry to interrupt, uh, but it was just that St. Helen, the whole time in the book, I was sort of noticing that because at one point she says non-erupting, like that's the word she puts right before it. And I know it was like, what, 73 when she wrote the book? Uh, uh, so 10 years later, right? Like the whole top third of that mountain's gone. <laughs> And it was really these looming things, these looming latencies, you know, that are just there in the book. Um, that really rang my bell this time reading it too. I don't know why. I mean, I've you know, it's been erupted every time since I read oh. it. But. Oh, I, I I had that reaction also when I was reading this. Well, that's why I describe this to people as this is not fiction. <laughs> this book is not fiction at all. This is reality. Non-erupting. More, more real than any non-fiction book you will ever read. Well, like like Philip K. Dick as well, I think this book uh, obtains a level of, of prescience that uh, Phil's work does and, and reality that Phil's work often does, um, a kind of hyper-reality. So yeah, I think I think this this definitely is a, is a resonant text with in that Phil Dickian style of like, huh, this was written before that actually happened. And then even like, all of the themes and all of the things that 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 George is dealing with in these different timelines and in, in, in slipstream worlds is like everything and we've been talking about today like this is reality this is like our cities are melting down essentially one way or another climate change plagues it's just a kind of a living book that is that is sort of a mirror for our own world right but is also giving us uh, a different relationship with that living world but uh it's also the eruption of the um, imaginal into the material. And so I totally agree with you, Thomas. And, and, and if we can understand it that way. Mm. Yeah. And see, my empathy was not with any of the characters. My empathy was uh, with the author. You know, and that, that that's the stance that embraces the wholeness for me. So I just leave that as a... Ursula Le Guin. Mm -hmm. Ooh, we should end. And I, I just had, I was seeing that, that quote of uh, T.S. Eliot's that she quotes, go, 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 said the bird humankind cannot bear very much reality. And she, and, and uh, the comment is made, I think in the author's voice, I'm, I'm not sure that actually we bear reality for 80 years. But when I read, in my take on that, quote from T.S. Eliot's poetry is that is when the imaginal world is breaking through into the material world in T.S. Eliot's poem. It's just starting to shimmer through. Mm -hmm. You're in the garden and things are starting to materialize from yeah. the liminal, from the astral and things are shimmering and the bird says, go, go, go. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Like get out here before, before you well, lose Well, save your mind. us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. I'm also reminded of that Rilke and uh, ain't every angel is terrifying kind of thing, you know, <laughs> um, there's an intensification. Uh, and again, that, that kind of speaks to the, the Akira uh, manga and film as, as sort of a, a, a good companion piece to this, although a bit darker in tone and not exactly about how to live in accord with the way, but there's still some of these same themes in there too, right? That explosion of intensity is, like Endel saying it, this, this, the bringing forward of the presence of origin in Gepster's terminology, but with the consciousness of the waking ego going like, yes, that's my power. This is great. I can direct this. And then what happens when you try to do that, right? 
um, I think the moral of the story is, is, is a very similar one for both of these, uh, both uh, Akira and, and The Lathe of Heaven. We should do an Akira watching night um, at some point. That'd be fun. Do you, do I just have like a, a time question for everybody. I mean, do you think, because this is, uh, it's all about time and all these timelines and all of this, you know, the fluidity and the, and, and, and the erasure and the, the downloading, but I feel like the more I look at it, the more I even look at his language, like Dr. Haber is not, he, not only is he not in right relationship to pretty much everything, but he's not even in relationship to time. From the very beginning, I was just looking when we were talking about him, you know, not being trans, like being duplicitous, being manipulative, not being transparent. And uh, because from the very beginning, there's this, he has one moment where he's like, shit, because it's no longer, it, there's a giant horse behind him, right? And and then, and then and then he says, he was staring blankly at him. Several seconds must have passed since Orr's question. He must not be caught out. He must inspire confidence. He knew the answers. And the third thing's in past tense, right? Like it's a closed circle. Like he knows the answers from that moment all the way to the end. So he doesn't, it doesn't matter what changes because he's, he's not in relationship to anything, including, including this, this time change, which never, I never twigged that. Yeah, that's a great catch, Kelly. Um... Yeah, I mean, and this whole thing is about like progress. Like this is what we meant, this is what we're meant to do, just progressively master the powers of, of now of the imagination to better the world. I mean, this is a his sense of time is 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 out of sync with the world, right? It's completely detached. It's such a great expression of the mental, right? That yeah, exactly that myopic. I've cone. got my pro I've, here it is. Mm -hmm. Here I'm here now, and here is my progress. And all this mm -hmm. other stuff that's happening that could potentially affect it is peripheral and not important because Exactly. Well, and what's the exactly. reference to dream time? I kept thinking of, of you know, you know, those cultures that are uh, live in dream time. And I think I can't remember the exact line here, but mm -hmm. he, he talks about the aliens living in dream time, right? Yeah, at the exactly. End. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that it goes was... right over your man's head. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> There's a line where he's saying, yeah, I'm just looking at the Kindle version of it. Um, where he's talking to George. He's like, under her direction, the reduction of human misery, physical and psychic, and the constant increase of valid individual self-expression is an ongoing thing, a constant progress. Progress, George. We've made more progress in six weeks than humanity made in 600,000 years. So he's completely enveloped with this sense of like, oh my God, we have to, I mean, that's why he, want, he was willing to kill Heather, just like, this is again ends justify the means can't let this slip into the wrong hands can't let this to be stopped right um yeah gotta, wow. gotta stay on your track you gotta stay on track mm -hmm. yeah and that's the same mentality that it, that sees the um aliens as enemies that mm -hmm. jumps to that conclusion it, you know and so that theme interweaves yeah yeah, for sure. And I, I love the the arrival of the aliens in the office <laughs> when they break through just like so I mean, at the so surreal. And then they try to like clarify, you know, exactly what they reify a little bit later on to, to George that this is, you know, needless suffering is going on. Um, so there's maybe a, a way in which uh, the aliens are, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, they're, they're being portrayed as, as like, violent monsters but really all they've been doing is is trying to land and stop missiles from hitting their ships by like deflecting missiles and, and that might yeah. have created collateral damage but they're like whoa hold on a second um so to the ego the unconscious is terror is absolutely terrifying you know when yeah. you and then all of a sudden you're going wow monsters it's monsters me. from the abyss yeah i have met yeah. the enemy and they are me you know <laughs> yeah, it's who i've been all along yeah mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah, and and that's the tragedy of, of Dr. Haber is is he's stuck in that loop of just staring at the emptiness that he's created in himself or his own loss from himself, his own unrightness with being. He's just stuck gazing at that that void, which goes back. Oh, we're gonna keep going back in like a Tolkien 
Gepser uh, Le Guin loop here, but you know the, we talked about this in a recent session with mutations about the perspectival eye and the eye of Sauron, sort of this grasping forth with uh, the void behind it, right? That it, can't, it cannot be filled, this sort of emptiness, which can only reach out and grab and, and, and capture what it is not. Um, so yes, <laughs> Another, more, more alignments there. Um, let's see, any points here? There's some good chat going on. Uh, yeah, so I mean, any other thoughts? But we've gone about 90 minutes. I feel like we can keep going for a long time, but for for the sake of uh, giving a, a digestible session for other patrons and, and mutations participants um, to not go too long. I think it would be fun to do a, a follow-up book. Um, we could continue in this Le Guinian uh, read. I mean, The Dispossessed would be good. Uh, of course, Always Coming Home, but I know that it's a bit different than the other reads. You have, to, you have to warm up to it because it's not exactly as, as, as linear as the other books are, but that's fine. I mean, any, anyone have any votes or, or desires to always come anything home. in particular? Okay. Yeah. Is that the last thing she published, the short stories? What is always I don't think it. No, it, she published it back in the 80s, but. Um, I don't even know it then. It's It's not even. It's not even. How does she describe it? An archaeology of the future? Yeah, yeah. It's not a novel. That, that had me hooked. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's post-novel. It's, 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 yeah. It's, it's a new art form. It, it, it's, it's, uh, um, it's got poetry. It's got description of an entire language. It's got um, uh, sort of descriptions of styles of performance. It's got mm -hmm. stories um, sort of told in the oral tradition. It's got um, a couple of narrative chunks, you know, that sort of weave in and out. And then it's got these sort of eruptions from kind of like a, an archaeologist from what might be our time so, somehow visiting this culture which doesn't exist yet yes yes uh, i love it i mean we could do that i see some folks saying the dispossessed some pkd i would love to do some more pkd um the one i always go to is like a starter for folks is, is ubic because it's 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 so it's shorter and it also has all of his themes, as, as he mentions also in the exegesis. So that would be a good one. Um, yeah, actually, Carrie, did you have any suggestions as, as Thomas is asking too? Um, gosh, I can never remember the names of the novel. It's <laughs> just a blur, one thing. The exegesis would be an interesting thing to read a section of, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, in t I, I personally think that the exegesis is a lot more interesting um, than the novels because in the novels he's putting his ideas really relatively sparsely into fiction. Mm -hmm. They're there, they're great, but you've got an awful lot of ray gun in between. Um, but at the same time, in terms of the Ballas novels, I can't remember which one. Do you remember the one where the record collect, where Yawa threatens to destroy somebody's record collection? That one. Uh, is that, is that radio, it's not Radio Free Album Myth, is it? Or is um, that... No, I don't think it is. It's one of the Valis novels. It's, um, I can look it up and I can, okay. um, I can work it out. Um, but that one, basically, um, let's have a look. I, I think I remember the character names. I'll put it in the chat when I remember. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, d I'm down definitely for some PKD, some Le Guin. I even say like, if if you're if you're okay with us doing more than one Le Guin, we could do like a little ongoing reading of Le Guin's like uh, works. I mean, the Lathe of Heaven is a good standalone, and I mean the Dispossessed is part of the Heinish cycle, which is good, and then that opens up the left hand of darkness, which is so good. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard to just like stop reading Le Guin if we're gonna open up the Highness Cycle books. Um but yeah, the dispossessed, uh always coming home. Um, maybe the left hand of darkness. Okay, let's just like kinda let's see which one lands first. But I, I definitely want 
to the divine invasion. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we could even do that one. Um, Did someone say that a book from Le Guin was made as a movie? Yes. This book was made into two was film adaptations. Yeah. Um, one was from, I forget the name of the network. It was from 2000 or so, 2001, um, which Le Guin did not like, but I actually have fond memories of it because I stumbled across it before having read the book as a kid and it was very surreal and dreamlike. So I think it did have some impact. It, it, it did impart something of the novel. Um, and then there's an old, and it's available on YouTube if you just Google The Lathe of Heaven. Yeah. It looks old. It's from 1980. The It doesn't have as much special special effects, but I think the acting is great. They cast a great mm -hmm. paper. I think George in the, in, the, in the PBS adaptation is a bit more... I don't know, emotionally volatile, but I th they, he's still pretty good. He's still pretty close. Okay. Um, okay. But that's quite good and it's more faithful to the book because okay. it's got it's got the aliens in it. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so both are good. Both are interesting, but yeah. One of them is available on YouTube. I don't know which mm -hmm. one. Yeah, the I'm old sure. one is, yeah. yeah. And that one's really good anyway. I mean, that's definitely worth... I think but, it won an but, award or something. It was like the first... Um, it was like PBS's first movie they did or something along those lines they're so. both available on youtube yeah maybe. yeah they both are yeah it was the okay. first pbs production she says that in the interview with moyer gotcha and they had no um, budget for special effects which was probably a good thing right <laughs> so i know I mean, it's kind of a tie right now between i feel like we're, we're on a Le Guin kick and then we can mix it up with some Philip K. Dick. Um, so, do, I mean, how, how do we feel about jumping into always coming home first? Is that good? Okay. Good, good. Okay. Lots of thumbs up. So I, re I would recommend I'm biased <laughs> doing always coming home and then we'll either switch it up with PKD and then go the next Le Guin book after that would be the dispossessed. And then we can kind of see where we're at and see if we want to go into like the Heinrich, the other Heinrich cycle books after that one um, and what else to mix it up with. So but we cannot good. read the exegesis and guess gaps are in like two or three weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, go course. on. Sure, you can. <laughs> <laughs> and the win <laughs> and watching the movies. I mean, yeah. <laughs> All right, this is good. This is good. All right, well, thank you, everybody. This has been a wonderful book club. I love the the what everything everyone is bringing to it. It's it's so wonderful. So um, appreciate you all, and I'm looking forward to our next read together. We'll, we'll put together a little schedule for us and, and maybe give us a little bit more time for always coming home. Um, maybe like two sessions rather than just a, a one off. <laughs> nice, nice, Thomas. All right, everybody. Oh yeah, uh, audiobook exegesis two times speed. There we go. There we go. I need to get that audiobook, Carrie. Um, it's definitely worth it. Okay, take care, everybody. See you next time. And if you're joining me, see you tomorrow for the mutations uh, Patreon call. Take care. Fantastic discussion. Bye. 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 What a great group of aliens. I love you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Endel. Awesome. Bye. <laughs>